will be short-lived. Long-standing grievances, inequalities, mistrust and social divisions do not simply vanish when the fighting stops. They can easily flare up again. And they can be worsened if people and groups hungry for change do not see their needs and vision for the future being addressed. We see this cycle playing out all around us. Each week, this chamber echoes with updates on the grinding conflicts that scar our world and their devastating humanitarian toll. One undeniable trend in this sharp increase in the number of non-state armed groups at the heart of these conflicts. Rebels, insurgents, militias, criminal gangs, and armed trafficking terrorists and extremist groups. Many coalesce around joint identities or shared beliefs. Others are opportunistic, driven by the profits of crime or the promise of power. We are seeing also a rise in military coups. And as the joint UN World Bank study Pathways for Peace found, many conflicts are deeply rooted in long-standing inequalities among groups. People feel excluded and marginalized. They are denied the same opportunities and justice as their neighbors because of their culture, race, skin, color, ethnicity, or income. While inequalities exist in every country, they are particularly rampant in countries where social services like health, education, security, and justice are lacking. And where the scars of colonialism are still visible, seen in arbitrarily drawn borders and historical advantages for certain groups over others. Against this backdrop, the COVID-19 pandemic has compounded inequalities and reversed development and peace-building gains. These inequalities and weak governance structures create a vacuum that is easily filled by the voices of intolerance and extremism that can lead to violent conflict. Conversely, inclusion is foundational to resilience and sustainable peace. Nowhere is this clearer than in the linkages between women's inclusion, gender equality and sustainable peace and security, as this Council will discuss later this month. Excellencies, as countries look to build sustainable peace, they need to include and involve all segments of the population in the process of rebuilding communities and sustaining peace. The idea is at the heart of the twin General Assembly and Security Council resolutions adopted at the conclusion of the 2015 and 2020 Peace Building Architecture Review. It is also at the heart of my new Agenda for Peace as part of the report on our common agenda. When we open the door to inclusion and participation, we take a giant step to forward in conflict prevention and peace building. Excellencies, I want to emphasize three areas in particular. First, national institutions and laws must work for all people. The proposed new agenda for peace includes a strong emphasis on inclusion at every step of a country's journey, before, during and after conflicts, and the state building takes hold and gathers speed. This means protecting and promoting human rights, including people's right to health, education, protection and opportunity. It means implementing policies and laws that protect vulnerable groups, including laws against discrimination based on race, ethnicity, age, gender, religion, disability, sexual orientation or gender identity. And it means working with all partners to develop strong national capacities anchored in human rights that can serve all people equally. Deuxièmement, les pays devraient envisager de donner plus de place aux régions infranationales. Les pays qui sortent de plusieurs années, voire décennies d'instabilité, ne peuvent se permettre d'ignorer l'opinion de pans entiers de la population et ainsi risquer d'attiser de futurs rancœurs. Les gouvernements doivent trouver de nouvelles méthodes pour faire avancer la population ensemble, à l'unisson, par un dialogue constant, tout en reconnaissant et en respectant les différences de chacun, et même si cela implique de déléguer certains domaines d'autorité. C'est pourquoi l'Organisation des Nations Unies, à travers les missions et les bureaux nationaux, 
of instability cannot afford to ignore the views of entire segments of their populations and thus risk fueling future resentments. Governments must find ways to move forward together as one through constant dialogue, recognizing and respecting differences, even if this means devolving some areas of authority. That's why, through our country presence and missions, the UN works to keep the lines of dialogue open and flowing between state institutions and local populations and groups at every point, so that everyone can have a hand in shaping their country's future. Women, young people and the most marginalized must be involved at every step on the way. Building and sustaining peace requires their voices and actions. That is why our peacekeeping operations and special political missions put a strong emphasis on greater inclusion and meaningful participation of women and young people. In Somalia, for example, UNSOM has trained young political aspirants from different political parties. And the mission has supported the government and women leaders in fully implementing the 30% gender quota in their country's elections. The Deputy Secretary General recently traveled there to highlight the critical importance of women's leadership in building and sustaining peace and security. As a global community, we must continue encouraging and supporting the full and active participation of women and young people in this journey. Excellencies, for countries emerging from the horrors of conflict and looking to a better future, indeed for all countries, diversity must not be seen as a threat. It is a source of strength, an anchor of peace and stability in parts of the world that have seen too little of either. And the rallying point for every person to contribute to a better future for themselves and for their societies. As a global community, let's find new ways to make this happen. And my thanks again to Kenya for highlighting this important issue, and I thank you. I thank the Secretary General for his briefing, and I now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Paul Kagame, President of Rwanda. Excellency Antonio Guterres, United Nations Secretary General. Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta, President of the Republic of Kenya. Excellency Tabo Mbeki, former President of the Republic of South Africa. Honorable Fawzia Kofi, former Deputy Speaker of the Afghan Parliament, permanent representatives, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I wish to start by thanking His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta for the invitation to join you today and for choosing such an important and a timely topic for this debate. Peace is much more than the absence of violence. The precondition for sustainable peace is a shared understanding of the root causes of the conflict by a broad range of stakeholders in society. Excellencies, allow me to offer a few thoughts on what this may entail, informed by Rwanda's own recent experience. First, peace building should be understood as an ongoing process, a constant search for solutions through dialogue and consensus, as we say in Rwanda. It may not be possible to entirely prevent all conflict. In fact, disagreements and grievances 
will always be there in one form or another. But the intensity and the impact of conflicts can be minimized by remaining attentive to local needs and expectations. This means investing in the capacity of institutions and individuals so they can deliver the results that citizens expect and deserve. Second, there is no universal template that can be transferred automatically from one context to another. External advice and examples can be helpful in encouraging reflection and finding new approaches, and we have benefited from various partnerships ourselves in Rwanda. Third, we must reckon with the growing power of social media to exploit vectors of divisions in society that can quickly weaken the social fabric. Finally, peace building is not a purely technical enterprise. It is deeply political and human and must take account of the emotions and the memories that various parties bring to the table. Multilateral organizations such as the United Nations and the African Union have a central role in many situations. Civil society groups, particularly those led by women, also have a key role, as do business leaders. However, even though we have had the opportunity to learn lessons from previous failures and successes of peace building processes, the international community's toolbox has hardly changed. Rwanda's post-genocide trajectory is marked by a consistent focus on national unity, inclusion, and service delivery. There are other positive examples from Africa and beyond. Practical and tangible partnership is critical. Rwanda's experience is that no matter how bad the situation appears, success is always an option. Let's build on today's debate and challenge ourselves to work together to demand better results in international peace building. Once again, I commend the Republic of Kenya for organizing this debate, and I thank you for your kind attention. I thank His Excellency President Paul Kagame for his statement. I now give the floor to His Excellency former President Thabo Mbeki to make a statement. Your Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, the President of the Security Council, Your Excellencies, members of the Council, Your Excellency Mr. Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, Your Excellency President Kagame, and the Honorable Ms. Fauzi Kofi, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank you, Chairperson, for the initiative you took to have the Security Council high-level open debate 
on peace building and sustainable peace, focusing on the important matter of the relationship between diversity on one hand and the peace and state building on the other. As council knows, a few years ago, the African Union took the bold decision to silence the guns by 2020. And this meant that the continent's political leadership came to the view that finally Africa must rid herself of the scourge of war and violent conflict, which had persisted for almost all of the years of independence. In this context, the African heads of state and government were fully conscious of the critical need for Africa of the sustainable peace which the Security Council has convened to discuss. As Council knows, over the years, more or less standard procedures have been followed to resolve conflicts which had broken out, certainly in Africa. The international community would intervene to ensure that the belligerents conclude a ceasefire agreement. Peacekeepers would then be deployed to ensure the observance of the ceasefire. Interim government arrangements would then be put in place and then Unfortunately, we're going to have to come out of uh, that uh, to bring you our regular show uh, at this time as uh, we prepare for the local government uh, elections. That is service delivery gauge with uh, Chris Salda and um, Colise. Well, that's it from me, Flo Ledov, and the rest of the team here at SATR. Thanks very much uh, for tuning in. We'll be back with you uh, tomorrow from 3 p.m. Please take care of yourselves. Cheerio.